Welcome to Between the Lines. This month we look at Refugee Tales, a series of books that bring together poets and novelists to tell the stories of individuals who've directly experienced Britain's policy of indefinite immigration detention. Presenting their experiences anonymously as modern day counterparts to the Pilgrim stories in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, the books offer rare intimate glimpses into otherwise untold suffering. The third volume of the book was published in 2019 and launched in parallel to an annual walking event that this year took place in the Sussex countryside that surrounds IDS. Each chapter in the book tells a different person's story and it's great to have the author of The Teacher's Tale, Emma Parsons, joining us for today's episode of Between the Lines. So Emma, welcome to IDS. Thank you. It is an amazing book. It's very thought-provoking, it's very well written and it comes from very personal perspectives. Um, I'm intrigued to find out a little bit more about how the book was written because it's all, each chapter is authored by somebody different. So you are the author of one chapter, but writing books isn't your usual day job, is it? So how did you get to be involved in Refugee Tales and the whole project? Yes, well, you're quite right. I mean, by day job, really, I'm a teacher and I've been a teacher for many, many years. Uh, working in schools in initially in Haringey and Tottenham and then for many years in Hackney. That's really what kick-started my involvement with people who have been asylum seekers and are refugees. So how did I get involved with Refugee Tales? Well, my concern about what happens to asylum seekers and refugees in the UK was first sparked by my involvement with families at the schools that I've worked in. Um, and seeing how basically how appallingly they are treated, so that was my initial uh, my initial interest in refugees. But I then decided to actually put my action where my mouth was, if you like, and I signed up with a charity called Detention Action, who are based in London, and became a volunteer visitor for them. And I was sent to a detention centre near Heathrow called Harmonsworth. There are two near Heathrow: Harmonsworth and Colnebrook. And I was assigned to visiting a young man there. He was in that detention centre for six months. He was then released on bail from that detention centre. Um, uh, for And he was out on bail for another six months. He had no idea during that time that he might be put back into detention. There's always that uncertainty um, hanging over your head. And... One day he was doing a routine reporting to a Home Office reporting centre. I happened to be with him. We were going to have a coffee together um, after. It's it's in the tale um, that I wrote, this this particular um, episode. And he was randomly picked up again and he was taken to Tinsley House, which is a detention centre near Gatwick. So I was working full time at the school, but by this time, this young man had become a friend um, mm. and he'd become a family friend. He's the age of my grown up children. And there was no way that I wasn't going to go on seeing him. So I started to visit him then in Tinsley House in the detention centre at Gatwick. And it was there that I came across this um, charity called the Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, because they also send visitors into detention centres near Gatwick. And it is the Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group that started Refugee Tales. Ah, I see. Because when you talk about it in that way, and it really comes across in the stories, that they're very personal. They're very much about a relationship. Each chapter is written in a different way, but you get that personal element that comes through in the stories. And I think, I mean, one of the things that, that intrigued me in The Teacher's Tale, in your your chapter is that you describe quite clearly how you felt that you were sometimes intruding into people's personal spaces and I'm thinking specifically about when you write about returning to the Walthamstow flat to collect the subject of your story's possessions whilst they're being detained to me it showed how lonely and isolated being detained can be and also to some extent how people are relying on the kindness of strangers Mm. and I wonder if you think that that's a fair comment to make Yes, I think relying on the kindness of strangers is is a key element in 
in the life of somebody who has gone through all this loss and trauma time and again. It's moments of active and positive human connection that are cited as the crucial turning points in these terrible and really epic stories of loss, brutality, trauma and helplessness. And as for the volunteer visitors from Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, they provide a hand of they provide a hand of reliable friendship and support, and importantly, they express unconditional acceptance and they bear witness. Mm. So when when we talk about that that sense of isolation and that perhaps infringement on that personal space, you, you write really clearly about going to the detainee's flat. And I wonder if perhaps you'll just read that extract for us. Sure. I went to Walthamstow to get your things. The place was empty. The grumpy roommate who never talks to you was out. I let myself in. Your little corner of the room was just as you had left it that morning. It reminded me of entering my brother's room after his sudden death. Your bed was unmade, lines of socks and underpants draped over the headboard, and a T-shirt drying over the back of your only chair, the green T-shirt that had been too small for my son. On the floor, neatly lined up, a cafetiere full of green tea, a jar containing your toothpaste, your shaving cream, two huge bags of rice, several brochures from adult education colleges, your Bible, dictionaries, the little souvenir turtle from Turkey, and piles and piles of papers, home office documents annotated in black by you and red by me, verb lists, exercises, library opening times, plastic bags full of tubes of watercolour paints and brushes. I was embarrassed to intrude on this, your only private space. But who else was going to get your things? It's beautiful. Uh, It's it's beautifully written. It really is. Thank you. But I've talked to other people about this and time and again people are taken into detention centres and there's nobody there to do what I was able to do, to collect their things. So they lose their things. Mm. And indeed, in um, The Stateless Person's Tale by Abdul Razak Gurna, the, the man in that, he expresses how he lost all his documents. He doesn't have any document left that proves who he is or where he comes from. You so, can't imagine, well, I can't imagine having you know, literally just lost all of that. And as I say, from the kindness of a potential stranger or as much as stranger, to just go and do that very practical thing of I'm just going to collect up your possessions and here they are, how how that would make you feel so much more secure. Do you know what I mean? A yes. very simple act. I exactly. Think. And it took some um, doing to get his keys off the guards mm. at the Home Office Reporting Centre. I said they wouldn't let me see him when they picked him up and took him. I, I was allowed a phone call, so he told me that they he thought they were going to detain him again. And I said, well, could you at least um, let me have his keys so that I can go and get his stuff? And that took some doing. So, I, I mean, this this is a common story. That's why I'm, mm. you know, articulating mm. it. Mm. And the other bit that you, you write very clearly about is, is this bit around language and um, perhaps, as as you say, why you were you know called or involved in the teacher's tale is obviously because of your ability with language. Do you want to just read that that passage that describes that? Sure, it's it's interesting actually because um, a a recent review of refugee tales um, was in unexpectedly in um, the EFL magazine, which is the English for fo- English as a foreign, foreign language, language magazine. Mm. And obviously the, the reason they did that is because they picked up my tale, the, the language aspect of it, and um, they've concentrated on the fact that, um, that this young man and I had to navigate this type of home office language. So here's the extract. We're in a detention centre now. He's back in the detention centre um, and I'm visiting him. Now all we have time for is another kind of English altogether. Not adult literacy, not ESOL, English for speakers of other languages, not EFL, English as a foreign language, not EAL, English as an additional language. The English we are forced to work on is EDL, English as a detention language, and it's no fun. 
Instead of role plays going shopping in a cafe at the doctor's, we are hunched over esoteric words and exhausting syntax that will determine your life. It's not just the words, appellant, respondent, alleges, purports, opportunistic, not credible. It means they don't believe you. It's the whole structure, a thicket of dashes, dots, colons, colon dashes, brackets, open and square, initials, acronyms, abbreviations and numbers, reference numbers, clause numbers, subclause numbers, legal article numbers. And how do you prioritise understanding? I think, I mean, what, what intrigues me about it is, you know, the book really is about simple storytelling and I can't impress upon people enough that it is really accessible. You know, it, it's one of those things that you can pick up and just dip in and out of a chapter. Um, and it obviously comes from a timeless tradition of, of simply connecting people and telling their stories. Um, but I, it's that, the thing that underpins it is that the, the collection is also a call for action. Mm. Um, and this whole idea of the UK rule of indefinite detention is is potentially something that sounds, you know, scary and legal and, you know, would you ever really want to read a book about something about that, and, you know, on your bedside table? Um, but actually you do, and I found myself literally doing that and, and dipping in. But I wonder if you can perhaps, in simple terms, just explain that that rule, the UK rule of indefinite detention, and and let us know a little bit about how that compares to other countries. Because the UK is quite different, right? Uh, the UK is different. And in a way, one can't even call it a rule of indefinite detention because it is actually against the rule of law, indefinite right. detention. And, um, you know, I think of um, detention itself and certainly indefinite detention as the Home Office's big secret. So few people know about it. I certainly didn't know about it before I got involved with Refugee Tales. It's basically for administrative convenience, but it's hugely expensive. Um, it costs the taxpayer a fortune, so it's a waste of money. It's a waste of time. Over 50% of people who are in, put in detention centres are then released back to alternative accommodation or back into the community if they have a family that they can go back to live with. And the UK is unique within Western Europe in that there is no maximum time limit on immigration detention. People don't know this. I mean, while the maximum time limit for people to, to be detained in France is 45 days, in the UK it is literally indefinite. People can be and are detained for months or even years. Refugee Tales knows of somebody who was detained for nine years and they've committed no crime. And you know, it's nine in, it, years? Yes, nine years. We're not talking about a few days or a mm. couple of months. Um, you know, many people are um, detained for years and re-detained. I think, you know, that's that's the horror. Well, the whole thing is ghastly. But mm. to to have the fear of being re-detained. And, you know, it's interesting to think if you're a terror suspect, for example, there is a time limit. <laughs> so, yeah. now, it... Detention centres are officially called Immigration Removal Centres, IRCs, as their stated purpose is to hold people who the government intends to deport from the UK. Now, around half of people in immigration detention are asylum seekers and many actually have family ties in the UK. So uh, I think there's about 27,000 migrants are detained in the UK every year. Wow. Yeah. Um, at present, there are 10 detention immigration removal centres in the UK. They're run by private security firms. Um, the ones at, uh, near Gatwick are run by G4S, you know, which you may have heard yeah, of because they, yeah. they run other things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They have people in detention centres have very limited freedom of movement. Um, they're often locked in at at night and during lunch times. In fact, there was a panorama program in 2018, which was about a undercover whistleblower, a young a young chap who'd signed up to be a G4S guard, and it's it's a chilling watch. And as a result of it, people have been guards have been suspended in that detention centre mm -hmm. because of the, their treatment of the people who are detained there. So I'm, I'm thinking, as you're saying it, I'm wondering what the justification is 
That's the word that's coming into my head. If someone's detained for nine years, how how can that be? Yes. If you're not accused of something, if you've done essentially nothing wrong, it's not. There's no there's no crime that's involved. I, I'm wondering yeah. how it gets just. How can that be? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, 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 that may sound like a really naive question or a naive point, but well, like I, I, so I many know. things, the policies and the rhetoric belie the reality yeah so I think if I were somebody from the home office sitting here I wouldn't be saying that people are detained for as long as nine years I would be saying you know immigration detention is only used for a short period of time before people are deported etc that sort Mm. of thing but immigration detention should be a last resort you know it should only be used when a person can shortly Mm. be lawfully removed from the UK when detention is strictly necessary to facilitate that removal and is and is proportionate no your your question is the million dollar question and Mm. it's it's a Kafka-esque world Mm. it's a world bogged down in Byzantine bureaucracy it's a world of what um David Constantine in his um tale the orphan's tale calls idle cruelty. It's a world of a broken system. That language is very evocative. You know, Mm. these chapters aren't just written as dry testimonies of people. They're very creatively written. Mm. There's one bit which is in one of the chapters, um, The Erased Person's Tale, which Mm -hmm. um, I think is written by Jonathan Wittenberg, and I'm hoping I'm saying his name right. He said that in interviewing and writing that erased person's tale that he became a companion in defiance against silence. Mm. And again, that comes, it really struck me because it's the idea of a companion. I'm, you know, it's not someone saying I'm an expert, but I'm here, I'm alongside you in the defiance against silence. Um, Can you perhaps elaborate a bit more about why you think these personal tales need to be told? And, And I suppose... It comes back to the kind of advocacy and the activism bit of it, of, of what you think the books are hoping to achieve. Mm. Well, I think that notion of a companion in defiance against silence um, runs throughout the tales themselves in the, the, the collaborative process between the writer who is retelling the story of somebody who has experienced attention. Um, uh it also runs through the um, whole remit of Gatwick Detainee's welfare group visiting system, that that companionship and being alongside somebody. But I think what's important about the tales is that the people whose tales are told, they are not voiceless, of course they're not, but they have they have had their voices taken away from them. Mm. They've been forced by the system to be voiceless, to be in a systemic and social no man's land, if you like. And that make that makes me think of a, a colleague of yours actually, I believe, here, a Michael Collier who mm, works at, at the University at, of Sussex. Yes. Mm. Now, on the last Refugee Tales walk, which was in July and took place near here in Sussex, we had talks every lunchtime, and the talks always have a theme. And this year, um, the theme was borders. And Michael Collier gave a talk on on borders, and he made me think differently about borders. And he said that borders are not necessarily where we think they are. There are borders around territory, and even those are not necessarily where we think they are. Mm. That's, a, that's another story. But there are also, there's also the notion of borders around population uh, and those borders that can change the rights and status of an individual. So that notion of being a companion in defiance against silence, I think, belongs to that because... So many of the people who uh, experience detention, they are still not across the border. Mm. Yes, they may be here or they may have made it to America um, or any other country, but they haven't actually crossed the border. There is a whole border of a social border, the border of 
well, ultimately citizenship, but there is, they haven't crossed the border, basically, of human rights. No, no. I mean, they're not integrated in any no. way. They're not, they're not seen as being citizens in any way. And they're not heard. Mm. So these tales provide um, a hearing. Mm. But um, in <laughs> fact, this year, the um, Refugee Tales Volume 3 does include tales by people who have experienced detention themselves. Right. And that's the first time. The first two volumes, the tales are all the retelling of people's stories as told to writers. But um, in the current volume, the latest volume, there are tales told by refugees themselves and um, asylum seekers. And they are, they are powerful verbatim testimonies as yeah. to what's and they going do, on. And, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. What I particularly like about the book is, is how accessible it is um, and how each of the stories is told in a very different style. Can you share a little bit more about the authors and how they were approached to write the tales? It, it comes across very much as a co-produced project and it would be good to know a little bit more about the processes behind the pages. Yes. Well, the editors of the book are Anna Pincus, who is the founder and coordinator of Refugee Tales. She's also the director of Gatwick Detainees Welfare Group, the charity. And David Hurd, who's a professor of modern literature at the University of Kent. He's also a poet. And in keeping with the Canterbury Tales, um, he wrote prologues for each of the um, three volumes of Refugee Tales. Uh, Refugee Tales started in 2014. Um, and the first walk was actually in 2015 when the first batch of tales were told in the evenings at the end of a day's walking. But I'm sure we're going to talk about the actual walk in a minute. Now, Anna Pincus and David Hurd, they wrote to writers whose interests and work were such that they thought the project would resonate with them. Writers such as Abdul Razak Gurna and Ali Smith, now, Ali Smith's novel Spring, which I, I recently read, fantastic novel, um, that draws a lot from her experience of working with refugee tales. So after their involvement, those writers kindly introduced other writers to the project. And these included writers um, that they knew to be interested in human rights or writers who had a migrant background, such as Gillian Slovo and um, Carmilla Shamsi, and they were given, the writers are given an open brief of how to approach the meetings with people who had, who had experienced detention and how to retell their stories. But most writers, in fact, wished to honour their stories by staying very close to the testimony that was shared with them. So how, how, it, happened, how it happens is mm. a meeting is arranged um, between a writer and somebody who has experienced detention in a neutral setting with a chaperone from the charity because oh, you know, okay. this is a big yeah. thing for somebody to do. Yeah. So people who've experienced detention, you know, they have been asked if they are prepared to tell their story. And you know, nine times out of ten, yes, they very much are. Mm -hmm. They want their story to be told. And then after they've had that collaboration, they have a say. They, they obviously see um, the story before it goes to press. They have a final say over it. But they also receive support. It could be daily, weekly, monthly for the subject of the tale, the anonymised subject of the tale, after the sharing, after they've shared their story with that person. I think it's important to say that those people who do share their tales, because these tales, you've read them, Kelly, mm -hmm. they are tales of, of, of terrible loss, terrible trauma, brutality, epic journeys, tales of relentless years of um, navigating not just territory but navigating systems, years of hostility, lack of welcome, hunger, all you know the list is is endless. So it's important to say that those sharing the tale they don't do so while they're in detention. Mm. You know there, mm. there, there has not been a collaboration between a writer and somebody who's experienced detention while they're in detention because, of course, the sharing could trigger PTSD. Uh, and in detention, there's no therapeutic support. In mm. fact, there's, there's quite the opposite of therapeutic support. And people have been wrenched from their families or their community support 
networks, so mm. there's nobody to turn to. So the writers, I mean, there, there, are, there are many writers, but just to name a few, Ali Smith I've, I've obviously named. Um, she's also the patron of, of Refugee Tales. Oh, I didn't realise that. Yes. Okay. Yes, she is. And Ali Smith has actually said of Refugee Tales, we will tell it like it is and we will work towards the better imagined. That, that quote of the better, we'll work towards the better imagined. Mm. I'm intrigued to know what does that look like. So what is the better imagined in that? So I guess where I'm coming from is this is series three of the book. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the walks as well in a second, because I think that that's a you know really important part of it. But I assume that a better imagined gets to a point where these books don't need to be written because the detention isn't happening. Or is that too simplistic? No, what is I, I, I think that is the better imagined. Of mm. course it is. I think it's a case of the the call for indefinite detention, we hope, will no longer have to be made, which mm. is what the Refugee Tales is about. It is calling for an end to indefinite detention. And if that ends, that is part of the better imagined. But also, I think the better imagined fits in really with the with what IDS is doing because I've been listening to your podcasts and it's really interesting how it, how these sort of ethos if you like of of IDS as I see it I mean I I know yeah. I don't know much about it obviously but it connects with the ethos of projects such as refugee tales and I was listening to the Hilary Cotton podcast, um, Hilary Cotton, who wrote Radical Help. And I was really struck by it because she was talking about reforming the welfare state. So mm. it's not directly to do with with this issue. But she talks about saying at the heart of reform is human connection. Yes. And of course, at the heart of what Refugee Tales is doing is human connection. Yeah. And it's that human connection that should bring about eventually the better imagined. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, that is, you know, the basis of a lot of the work that, that happens here at IDS is, is all, you know, built on partnerships and and uh, that human level of connection to understand really complex issues. One of the things that, that we do quite a lot of here at IDS is um, try to think of different ways to help people to to talk about things because you know sometimes it gets they're quite complex topics so you know there's all sorts of different workshop techniques and different creative methods and ways that um that we work in a very participatory way to get to complex subjects one of the formats is a thing called workshops mm. yeah and it's a lovely thing i mean we're, we're based in a beautiful campus here in sussex so you know we'd be really remiss not to go out and walk in the fields around us but the idea around workshops is very much that you walk and talk and quite often the people will start to talk in a different way when they're walking you know you're not looking at somebody and you're striding out and you're you're letting your ideas flow which is very different from sitting in a room and raising your hand or you know being um in a kind of classroom setting it's this idea that you walk and talk really simple and we do quite a lot of that here at ids so what was interesting um I think with the whole refugee tales um, side of it for me was that this isn't just a series of books at all. No. It's, it's, that's very much just part of a, a whole project, a whole ecosystem, if you like. And the, the walk that takes place every year, um, luckily, obviously, this year for us took place in and around Sussex. It'd be really nice to just hear a little bit more from your side of things about the accompanying walk and... I think the thing that I took away from it is that it's that that shared experience. It's bringing together a community of people yes. to, to walk. Well, walking is incredibly powerful. Um, I know a, a therapist who says she often wishes she could actually walk alongside her clients instead of having them, you know, sitting yeah. in front of her or lying on a couch. I mean, walking is. Walking is, it's like dancing, music, sport. It's, it's its own form of communication. It's its own language, if you like. And it's a way of sharing and creating intimacies. 
uh, it's an equalizer mm. as well. Mm. And uh, it offers opportunities for people to support each other, regardless of um, sort of initial power relationships, if you like. All that goes by the board. Um, the balance of power completely shifts. And it, it also, I find, I mean, I love walking. <laughs> and, um, I'm involved, very involved in the walking side of refugee tales as well. And um, I think it's a great way of accelerating intimacies. It's also a very uh, powerful way of being able to share stories. And in fact, David Hurd um, puts it in the afterward to Refugee Tales, Volume 3. I mean, he says, to tell and to hear a story is to establish an intimate connection, a connection that the hostile environment sets out explicitly to break. Because you've got to remember that asylum seekers are constantly telling their stories to asylum officials. So David goes on to say, the sharing of the story is a potentially dangerous act. So it is for this, these reasons that the Refugee Tales project arrived at a collaborative model of storytelling as a way of sharing the stories of people who had experienced indefinite detention, which did not render individuals unsafe. So the walk has developed as a thing it's sort of in and of itself, but also as part of the sum of the parts of Refugee Tales. So he says, at the same time, however, as the project has grown and developed, all manner of other modes of storytelling have emerged. The walk itself is one long, multiply evolving set of stories, mm -hmm. a mobile setting in which stories start up and intersect. It is a process that has gradually spilled out so that as others have become interested in what Refugee Tales does, people who walk, who have experienced detention, have spoken in Parliament, to the BBC and to other broadcasters and at festivals and events across the country. So that is the power of stories. Stories stories you know, take root they grow stories fly <laughs> they take well, flight they, they do i mean god i i could talk about stories as a means forever and a day but can i take you back to the book for for a moment one of the chapters i really like is written by lisa apignese um, and she tells the dancer's tale yeah so this obviously fits quite nicely what we've just been saying about around dancing and stuff but the bit that i particularly like is that she writes about encountering her interviewee and realising that she herself has had lots of preconceptions about refugees and so when she's first meeting um, this person in a, a public space she writes you don't look like a refugee you're calm and perfectly poised I must be wrong um, and I guess that these stereotypes of what we all have in our in our heads you know they're fueled by images from the, from the news of people that are you know disheveled and in terror and and it really comes through really clearly that actually she, she's saying you know she quite shocked herself that, that even she was thinking hang on you don't look like a refugee um how how far do you think that this this kind of media image that we have and uh, how far do you think that that those stories these stories and tales help to debunk the myths and the realities of, of refugees? The media image is um, irresponsible. Uh, I mean, the media, the language the media uses, um, swarm, mm. flood. Mm. I mean, even migrant, you know, just that, that, that's othering thousands of individuals into one group just like that even actually it's hard not to use the word detainee because it's a quick shorthand but I don't know if you've noticed I've deliberately been trying to use the phrase people who have experienced detention because yes. they're people yeah and Ali Smith's tale um, in the first volume is called the detainee's tale and I know that I mean I don't know because I haven't talked to her about it I don't know her um, but I I am sure, being Ali Smith, she will have deliberately used that term uh, to point out that somebody is dehumanised, um, is, is othered by those yeah. kind of terminologies. Yeah, labels, yeah. And yes, I mean, in The Dancer's Tale, um, 
she yeah she she talks about refugees so harrowing images of women and babies on sinking boats leap into my mind a tattered angry mass at the jungle in calais children behind barbed wire fences clamoring groups in tented cities yes well that is all absolutely mm-hmm. true mm-hmm. but all those people are individuals yes. who are suffering something that they didn't expect to suffer and on that, on that sort of image of refugees, um, Shami Chakrabarti said of refugee tales that it's a wonderful way of rehumanizing some of the most vulnerable and demonized people on the planet. And I think that's, um, you know, it's very... It kind of says it all, yes. doesn't it? Emma, I want to thank you very much for coming in to IDS today. And um, a a thanks really to all of the authors and all the people that have been involved in putting the books together and the walks, because um, I think it is very much about lifting up the stories of of human beings and, and hopefully, as you say, bringing them all into the light. So thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the first episode of Series 2. You may have noticed that there's more of my voice in this episode than usual. I'm Kelly Shepherd, and I lead the knowledge and impact work at IDS. And as the voice of Between the Lines, I'm not usually the one interviewing, but I've been involved in the walks and this is a subject that's close to my heart. Refugee Tales is a great introduction to series two, where we'll focus on books for a better world and how understanding people's lived experiences are key to bringing about change. Also, a thanks to everyone who's been in touch. It's great to hear from you and get your feedback and ideas for future episodes. Keep them coming. Email between the lines at ids.ac.uk or tweet us at ids underscore UK. Hashtag IDS between the lines. <laughs> <laughs>